So, uh, the first thing I want to I want to ask is, um, how many of us in here have purchased a new fly rod, thinking it's going to make you a better caster? <laughs> right. Nobody. Bull. I don't believe it. I don't believe it because I have, but I'm a pretty good caster. Um, so for, for those of us that, that have fallen into that, that trap, uh, it doesn't work. <coughs> I'm just going to tell you that. A really good fly rod, a premium fly rod, uh, in the hands of a really good caster is going to make a difference. Um, if you were used to casting, just, just as to draw a comparison, if you're used to casting a glass rod and you go to a graphite rod, it's going to perform differently. It's going to perform better. There is absolutely no argument that the technology has moved us forward greatly. But unless you have the fundamental skills, a $1,200 nine foot six weight will not perform any better or make you a better caster or a marginally better caster than a $300 nine foot six weight. You may think as a guy that owns a fly shop that I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot, but I don't make any money on fly rods anyway. So I would rather, I would rather take your money in casting lessons or fly lines um, to, to help improve your cast, then go out and drop a half a paycheck, or in some people's cases a whole paycheck, on a new fly rod thing that's going to make you a better caster. So with, with that out of the way, I'm just, going to, I'm just going to go around the room and put your hand up for me, please. Tell me some of the things that you struggle with in casting. Just blurt it out. Still do a tailing loop, when I, especially when I get tired. Okay, it, it's probably probably the most common um, visual fault that you could see in a in a caster. What about um, overusing the shoulder? Overusing the shoulder um, it never happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean the cast does come from, and, and, I, and I'll get a little deeper into this. Uh, as I, as I go on, but the cast does come from the elbow and the shoulder. There's only one way, and, I, and, I, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, go to, right to, to um, Sheldon's comment so, about tailing loop. What a tailing loop is, if, if this is the, the fly rod, what a tailing loop is, is it's, it's a loop that's dropping, the top leg of the loop is dropping below the bottom leg of the loop. That's, a, that's how we tie wind knots. Wind knots have nothing to do with wind. And everything to do with your ego. And, 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 <laughs> and whoever, whoever coined okay. that phrase, and that, that was, that's exactly it. Um, it, was, it was a way to, 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 to make them feel better about themselves. Um, so. The tailing loop, this, this being the, the, the top leg of the loop dropping below, when you come forward with that, basically what you're doing is, is you're causing the, the fly and possibly the leader to shoot straight through that loop and that's where you get your knot. We don't very often get them in the big, in the fly line, although you can if you come forward way too soon. It usually happens in the, uh, in the, 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 the leader. So how do we eliminate that just as one problem? Anybody? Spicer's not here. He'd have his, I'm sure he'd have his hand up. The, the, the most common, uh, no, and, and a little bit. Yeah. The most common, the most common um, uh, cause of a tailing loop is overpowering either your forward cast or your backward cast. And this is a little bit difficult to show because I I just don't really have the, the, the room in here, so I'm going to try and draw it for you. But basically what happens is, is when, you, when you make a cast with proper timing and you, and you pause long enough to allow the line to, to straighten out on your back cast, when you come forward and, and inadvertently punch it forward, thinking that you may be able to drive another six or eight feet out, what you're causing the rod tip to do is bend unnaturally deep, okay? This causes the rod, the, 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 the rod tip to travel 
in a concave path like this. When I first started doing a lot of um, uh, training and being coached for various FFF certifications and so on, the single biggest, the single most important thing that anyone ever said to me, I was taking a course with a guy by the name of Chris Sepio about 20 years ago. And Chris, at that point, first brought up the concept of the rod tip traveling in a straight line path. And that, if you take one thing from, from this half hour, 45 minutes, it is that. In order for you to do anything, it doesn't matter whether you're roll casting, sidearm casting, cat-handed casting, if your rod tip is not traveling in a straight line path, then we really don't have anything after that. But there's, a, there's another side of that that I've sort of picked up over the years of teaching that I think is equally important. So what I'm talking about with the rod tip traveling in a straight line path, if I'm holding, I'll grab this and see what I can, see what I can do here. Um, when, when I make a cast, if I'm breaking my wrist, it's a little bit more difficult to see because I don't have a reel on here, but if I'm breaking my wrist, what's happening to my thumb? What is my thumb doing right now? It's traveling in an arc, right. So if my thumb is traveling in a one and a half inch arc here at nine feet up, that arc is, I'm not doing anything different with my thumb that arc is amplified, if you will. So what that's going to result in is what, would re what we would refer to as a very open or inefficient loop. When you, if you've taken any sort of uh, formal casting lessons, we're always told don't break your wrist, don't break your wrist, don't break your wrist. And that's true to some degree but I'm a very wristy caster. If you sneak up behind me on the, on the river and watch me cast, you'll say, Jesus, he was a really wristy caster. But I've also made it work for me. And in, in the trout world, I can, I can do that because I'm also using my shoulder and my elbow to keep everything traveling in a straight line. And, and if you can look on a horizontal plane, right now, my thumb is traveling in a fairly straight line, is it not? But I can't do that with just my wrist. I have to use the elbow and the shoulder. Mechanically, you can't, you can't get something to do that without at least one other joint, right? So your cast should almost be, uh, a, I would describe it as a push and a pull far before I would describe it as any sort of a flick, okay? so. When we look at the fly rod, as I'm making a, a forward cast, my thumb and the rod tip is still traveling in a fairly straight line. Unless you're a machine, it's impossible to get it to go in a perfectly straight line. But the best casters that you see, if you go to a, to a, a fly fishing show, there's a few guys that just jump to mind for me as far as the, the best pure casters that I've ever had the opportunity to, to fish or cast with. Chris Sepio was one. Um, some of you may remember Bruce Richards from 3M. Anyone? He was the, he was the chief line, the head line designer for scientific anglers for years. Um, he also happened to, to do my FFF certification, but um, Jerry Seam from Sage, he's another one. When they pick up a fly rod and start casting it, their loops, are, are so perfect that it almost looks mechanical. And the reason is, over the years, through muscle memory, they've, be, they've been able to, to uh, master and maintain that rod tip traveling in a straight line path, okay? So, we're talking about tailing loops, and, and basically, if you go up the scale here, as you're as your rod tip is traveling in a straight line, as your rod tip is traveling in a straight line path, your loop is going to be 
nice and tight and wind resistant. As the wrist starts to break and that arc starts to open up, then the loop two will start to open up. That's still not a bad loop. If you're out there and, and, and you're casting and you're, you're trying to obtain something that's 18 inches, a loop that's 18 inches, you're really shooting for the stars because in order to do that, you gotta be doing it a lot. If you can get that loop, I tell my students, if I see a six foot loop, and that may seem pretty big, but I'm, I'm not quite six feet, but if the bottom leg of my loop and the top leg of my loop is within my height, I'd be pretty happy with that. A really nice um, uh, getting it done kind of loop is somewhere around three feet. It's not necessarily 18 inches. But in order to achieve that, we have to have that rod tip traveling in a straight line path. So as the arc starts to really open up and you really start breaking that wrist, what happens now is that loop becomes really wide open and sloppy. And the importance of this kind of loop is everything else that we do in fly casting and essentially fly fishing comes from that. Believe it or not, if you can cast a nice tight loop, then you can do just about anything you want with a fly line. Now you may argue, and, and, and I've seen it myself, that some of the best fishermen I know are not the best casters, and vice versa. Some of the best casters I know are not the best fishermen. But the one thing that they'll always have in common is reasonably tight loops. So it doesn't matter whether you're roll casting, because if I, if I, um, I'm going to try this. When I'm when I'm overhand casting, and and you all you all know, um, you know the, the basics of an overhand cast. Can I get you to just step on that for me? So your overhand cast is just as it sounds. It's an overhand cast. That's that's your cast. With the fly with the rod tip traveling in a straight line path, then. You can, you can become very efficient, you can become accurate, shoot line, get greater distance, uh, and deal with wind. If your loop is very open, then you, you lose all of that. The, the wind can take over, everything is compromised. So that's your overhand catch. Stop, accelerate forward, stop, accelerate back, so on and so forth. A roll cast is basically half of an overhand cast. This is, if I'm stopping, if we're using the old clock face uh, 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 analogy, the, the 10 to 2 and a clock face, then I'm stopping my rod tip here on, a, on, a, on an overhand cast and then allowing the rod to load and come forward. The difference, the only difference between a, a roll cast and an overhand cast is I'm using the resistance of the line in the water to load the rod. So I'm going to make as I, as I fished it out, I'm going to come back into that 10 to 2 position, or that, we'll say 10 o'clock position. I form a little bit of a loop behind me, but see how much line is still in the water? I won't hit you with this, by the way. But if I come forward in a very open loop, see how, see how open that was? If I come forward in a nice straight line path, that loop then tightens right up and yeah, you're good, thanks. And you can do a lot with the roll cast. So going back to the loop control thing, everything that we do in fly casting is developed and made better by good loop control. Even now, after doing this for, after casting for over 40 years, I still take about 10 or 15 minutes almost every day I go. It doesn't matter whether I have a two-handed rod, or single-handed rod, pardon me, and I take my fly off and I just practice. Just 10 or 15 minutes of just working on loop control. Keeps the, the muscle memory, because when we're fishing, we're not casting nearly as much. If you go for, say, a, a, a lesson in casting, 
you're going to cast a lot more than you would in an hour or 90 minutes than you would in a day of fishing. Because when you're fishing, you're fishing the fly out and moving, walking, stopping, looking. When you're casting perpetually, you're, it, 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 as in a practicing uh, 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 scenario, you're helping to develop that muscle memory. Rick Warwood, who I'm sure some of you have heard of over the years, he hasn't been in the game as much the last few years, but he's another one of those, those guys that I'll put in that sort of pure casting um, uh, group. And he told me, as, as odd as it sounds, he'll sit at home and use his wainscoting on the side of his, of his uh, living room wall to track his thumb going in a straight line path. And I found myself many times just sitting in my, watching a hockey game or whatever, and just doing that, just to see what it takes and, and help to maintain, build those, those little muscles in the, in the shoulder, elbow, and wrist to get that rod tip traveling in a straight line path. So that is on what I call the horizontal plane. The one thing that I've found over the years of, of teaching and doing various demonstrations is the rod tip traveling in a straight line path on the horizontal plane is only half of it. Because it still has to be traveling in a straight line path on what I refer to as the lateral plane. And that's this way. You don't want, and a lot of, a lot of casters, especially novice casters, will have the tendency to bring the rod tip around for fear of hitting themselves with a fly. And the minute that you, that you introduce that, what we call a hook, hooking's fun, Dave. <laughs> um, that was a joke. What we call a hook, <laughs> you're, you're basically killing all the energy in the cast. How many of you have heard the old adage, your fly will follow the direction of the rod tip. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's all bullshit. The fly will follow in the direction that the casting stroke begins. And what I mean by that is, if you're casting in a straight line path on, again, what I refer to as the lateral plane, then yes, your fly will track very nicely and lay out in a nice straight line in front of you. If you're hooking your rod tip, again, for fear of hitting yourself, and you make that same cast with the same application of power, your fly is going to end up over there. Because that's the direction, as we accelerate into a fly cast, that's where the majority of the energy is starting, and that's where the fly will end up. So as your rod tip hooks, your fly line will also end up hooking. So straight line on the horizontal path and on the lateral path. Don't be afraid of getting hit with the fly. Doesn't happen that often. If your barbs are pinched down, it's not a big deal. Um, so the pinch, guy knows what he's doing, he can get that hook out of Pinch, you pinch your barbs down. <laughs> sound like, sound like Bob, uh, Bob Barker. Have your best made or new. Pinch your barbs down. Uh,